So we stopped yesterday with the declarations of the rights of man and of the citizen. And I said we'd start today with the March to Versailles. So on October 5th, 1789, the women in the markets of the city of Paris are getting very close to actually rioting. And what they're so upset about is the very, very high price and scarcity of bread. Remember yesterday I said that Jacques Necker, when he uh, again, again became Director General of Finance, one of the first things he'd done was to discontinue exports of grain. Grain and what you make from it, primarily bread, um, are the major components of the French peasant diet. Um, I think you've all had some pretty fantastic French bread in your lifetime. Um, and it is wonderful stuff. So if the bread is hard to get and very expensive, uh, this is going to upset the women because the women are at the market buying food to feed whom? To feed their kids. So ultimately these women uh, complaining about the price of bread and how it's so hard to get, uh, get mixed together with some revolutionaries and they turn into a mob. They ransack the city armory and they end up with weapons. And they start marching. And they start marching to Versailles. Versailles is uh, several miles outside of Paris. Uh, remember Louis the 14th had been traumatized and did not like Paris and so that's why he built his, Paris, his palace outside the city. Um, ultimately, the women aren't going out to do anything to the king. That's not their intent. Um, what they want to do is they, the king is their father. He's their provider. He should be looking out for them. And they think that he must just not know about the situation with the bread and how difficult it is for them to get uh, to feed their families. So they're going to go out to Versailles and they're going to tell the king and they expect that he will solve their problem. Uh, when they get out there, the king won't come out to talk to them. So they end up basically laying siege to the palace. They won't let anybody in or out. And they demand to see Louis. Uh, early the next morning, there's an unguarded gate someone discovers. And they get into the palace. And they, they rampage through the halls, searching for the queen's bedchamber. Um... Remember the problems that Marie had had uh, with the whole consummation of marriage thing and people gossiping about her. Um, there are all kinds of flyers and leaflets that have been being passed around in France blaming Marie Antoinette for all of the problems of the people of France. They're scapegoating her. And so these women um, who have marched to Versailles want Marie um, really as a result of one of the most recent ones of these pamphlets uh, where it was said that the queen was told about the people's hunger and the fact that they had no bread and the quote in the pamphlet says that Marie responded if they have no bread then let them eat cake now if you are a poor peasant that's a pretty insulting thing to hear because bread is made of flour and water and egg and yeast and salt. Cake is made of all of the same stuff and sugar. And if they couldn't afford flour for bread, they surely couldn't afford sugar. So this was seen as a very, very insulting thing. The truth is that Marie did not say that. Uh, it was made up. It was libel. Uh, it was made up for the purposes of... of uh, belittling the queen and, and riling the people up. So while this mob is rampaging through the hallways of Versailles, uh, Marie is alerted to them and escape, escapes out of a hidden door uh, into a back servant's hallway in the palace, and she escapes. Um, in this process, several royal guards are killed, um, at least two of them ended up with their heads separated from their bodies and hoisted up on pikes uh, carried by the mob. Um, 
they occupy the palace. They demand that the king and his family return to Paris with them. Now remember, this had been a peaceful thing at the start that uh, through mob mentality kind of got out of hand. Ultimately, the king and his family do emerge and return with the mob to Paris. By that time, the mob is about 60,000 people that can be pretty persuading even for a king. Uh, When they get back to Paris, the family is housed in the Tuileries Palace, uh, which had been the royal palace in Paris um, before Louis XIV built Versailles, and now is going to be the royal palace again. Things have been changing elsewhere in France. Um, In July of 1790, a document is introduced called the Civil Constitution of the Clergy. Now remember, France is primarily a Catholic nation, though there are significant numbers of Protestants. The problem with Catholicism uh, in the mind of the French government is that when people are tithing to the church, that money is going to the church and to the Pope and to Rome, and it's not helping France. And so this document called the Civil Constitution of the Clergy takes the Roman Catholic Church in France away from the Pope and gives it to the French government so that the government controls the church, meaning that the government is going to get the profits from Uh, the Catholic uh, revenue sources. The civil constitution of the clergy subordinates the Roman Catholic Church to the French government. That's one thing. Second, it ends monastic orders. That's where the monks go uh, into uh, cloisters. The civil constitution of the clergy also ratifies the fact that church lands have already been confiscated by the French government. So uh, the church lands that were being rented out um, or used for profit-making purposes, all of that money is now coming to the French government as well. After a year in captivity, um, actually almost a year and a half in captivity, over a year and a half in captivity. Do a little math there. After over a year and a half in captivity, on June 20th, 1791, the royal family embarks on what is known as the flight to Varennes. Their goal is to go east. They want to escape home, which by their minds at this point is to Austria, where Marie's brother is the emperor, Joseph II. Um, they are arrested in the city of Varennes. They were almost safe. Varennes um, was not a border town. In fact, it's 50 kilometers away from the fortified royalist city of Montemedy, and you do not have to know that. Um, But had they made it to that royalist city, the royalists would have seen to their safe escape out of France. Now the people of France are good and ticked. Um, Before this, the king was going to be a part of everything. Uh, They still believed in him as the father of the people. Now he's tried to flee, he's tried to escape, and uh, they don't trust him. They return him to the Paris, and now he's not living in the Tuileries. He is imprisoned in the Tuileries. Now, everything that's going on in France is not going unnoticed by the rest of Europe, especially the imprisonment of the royal family after the flight to Varennes. In August of the same year, just a few months later, the Declaration of Pilnitz will be issued. And what the Declaration of Pilnitz says is that it says Austria and Prussia declare their support of Louis XVI against the French Revolution. Austria, of course, is in on this because Marie Antoinette's brother is the emperor of Austria. He's going to defend her. Why would Prussia 
go in on this. Prussia would go in on this because Prussia is ruled by an absolutist monarch who does not want to see any monarch unseated. The Declaration of Pilnitz calls on other European powers to intervene if Louis is threatened. It also said the following. It said Austria would go to war only if all other major European powers also went to war with France. I'll jump off the bridge, but only if all of the rest of you do too. I'm not doing it alone. One person sits out, it's not happening. The reason that clause was put in there was so that Austria wouldn't have to go to war. Austria was having her own problems in Central Europe, uh, having difficulty maintaining things there. Uh, there are nationalist groups within Austria causing problems. Um, it was a lock that Austria would not have to go to war because there's another European power who has no interest in going to war with France. Think for a second. Britain. Britain has no interest in going to war with France. In 1791, Britain has just been defeated in what they call the War of Rebellion or the War in the Colonies. We call it the American Revolution. Britain is in no shape to go and fight another war. Uh, they had the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War, followed by the American Revolutionary War, and now uh, the prospect of fighting France is not at all appealing to them. So, the only reason that Austria agreed to the Declaration of Pilnitz was to satisfy the royalist emigres who are leaving France uh, to hide out in Austria, or to shelter in Austria. Um, the, the monarch did not want them turning on the Austrian monarchy. Now, although we can interpret all of those hidden meanings of the Declaration of Pilnitz now, and look at the fact that Britain wasn't about to go to war against France, and so know that Austria was in no way ever going to get into this, and so it wasn't a real threat. The National Assembly looks at the Declaration of, the, of Pilnitz and says that European powers are going to intervene if Louis is threatened. Well, imprisoning him is pretty threatening, and so the National Assembly looks at this declaration and says, uh-oh, Austria is going to go to war with us. And they're a little freaked out. On September 3rd, 1791, the tennis court oath is finally kept. We have a constitution. It's known as the Constitution of 1791, and it is adopted on September 3rd. Here's what it does. It simplifies the judicial system and uses elected judges and prosecutors. No one is appointing them out of favorites and cronies. It eliminates provinces. This is the subdivisions within France like we have states within the United States. It replaces those provinces with départements, 83 départements. Each one of those départements is further divided into smaller administrative units with elected local assemblies. This is not at all different than what we have here. We have our federal government, then we have our states, and our states are divided into counties, or in the case of Louisiana, parishes. So our states are the equivalent of the French Revolution's département, and then they have smaller units, which we would call counties. The king is still a part of the government. So at this point, the Constitution of 1791 has created a constitutional monarchy. The king is able to appoint and dismiss ministers as he pleases. He doesn't need to get anyone's approval or ratification of this. The power to create law 
is given to a new body called the Legislative Assembly. The right to vote is limited under the Constitution of 1791. Who gets to vote? Well, they divide the population based on wealth, and they say there are active citizens and there are passive citizens. French men who are 25 or older get to vote if they pay taxes equivalent to three days wages. So basically you're being charged a tax, a tax to vote and it's the equivalent of three days wages. That is a lot of money to a French peasant. And so what they've done by instituting this tax is keep very many peasants from voting. By paying that tax, you go from being a passive citizen to being an active citizen. And it is just the tax that differentiates. So if you're a French man who is 25 or older and paid three days wages worth of tax, you could vote. If not, no good. Now you're not voting directly for the candidate. Active citizens get to vote for electors who then choose their representatives to the legislative assembly. So it's not direct election, it's what's called indirect election. So what we call this is limited male suffrage. Suffrage, it's not suffering, it's suffrage. And it is uh, the idea that you get to vote. The right to vote is called suffrage. It is very common among European constitutions of the 19th century that if you own property or have wealth, you get to vote. The Constitution of 1791 preserves slavery and the slave trade. Why? We're, we've had the Enlightenment. We know slavery is wrong. This Constitution preserves those because they are profitable. They can be taxed. The people who engage in them can be taxed. And France needs money. Here's the really surprising thing about the Constitution of 1791. Jews are enfranchised. Enfranchised means get the right to vote. Jews are enfranchised. Pretty remarkable. When we're talking about um, the fact that England hadn't allowed, even allowed Jews in the nation for 400 years, and France here is allowing them the right to vote. Okay, so the Constitution of 1791 uh, creates another government body. Add this to your list that starts with the Ancien Regime and the Estates General. The newest one is the Legislative Assembly, and we date it from October 1st, 1791, because the elections had to be held. Just because you've passed the Constitution doesn't mean, bing, bang, boom, you've got an immediate group of people. So the Legislative Assembly will meet for almost a year. It's chosen by indirect election, as I just described. Now here's how it works. Remember I said they have all of the legislative power. They get to make all of the laws. The king can temporarily veto but the Legislative Assembly can override by approving that bill in three successive meetings. So they have to meet, if he vetoes the bill on Friday, they meet on Monday and say, yes, we still want to do that. They meet on Tuesday and say, yes, we still want to do that. They meet on Wednesday and say, yes, we still want to do that. The king's veto is, uh, is ignored then, okay? Interestingly, in the election for the Legislative Assembly, they say that no one who was in the prior body, the National Constituent Assembly, is allowed to be elected to the Legislative Assembly. So what that means is that anybody who has any experience in government is going to be out. And so what you end up with is more radical and more inexperienced people in the Legislative Assembly. 
women were not given the right to vote, but they do get some rights from the legislative assembly. Okay. Some of those rights are these. Eventually, laws are passed that say all children can inherit. The concept of primogenitor is abolished. Primogenitor is the idea that land and property go to the firstborn son, and a daughter would get nothing. So that is abolished by the Legislative Assembly. Under the Legislative Assembly, illegitimate children and their mothers are able to go after the fathers in court for support of those illegitimate children. Prior to this, if a woman, uh, in, the, in the words of the time, uh, got herself in trouble, it was solely her fault, solely her responsibility, and she had to deal with it. The thing is, women had very little means of making um, a living and were reliant upon men for support. And so if you weren't married to the man who had fathered your child, both you and the child are going to be in really bad shape. Um, women are still not made active citizens. And here's the interesting thing. This is because Rousseau objects. Rousseau, the Enlightenment philosopher who talked about rights for all, says that women are just childbearers and are incapable of participating in public affairs. Basically what he says is that women are baby factories and don't have the mentality to participate in governance. Olympe de Gouge will write a document called The Declaration of the Rights of Women and the French Citizen. The Declaration of the Rights of Woman and of the French Citizen. And what she is saying in that document is that women should have rights too. When she publishes this, she sends a letter to Marie Antoinette, the queen, asking for her support. During the more radical phases of the revolution in years to come, that letter is going to be brought up and Olympe de Gouges is going to be executed for being a royalist sympathizer simply because she had written to the queen asking for the queen's support of women's rights. That should give you an idea of how radical and out of control the revolution is going to get. It kind of starts here with the establishment of the cult of reason in January of 1792. Churches are closed. Clergy are tortured. And the Cathedral of Notre Dame is turned into a temple of reason. The idea that the church can be used to control the people is not something that um, the French Revolution embraces. Instead, they want to create a replacement for the church to uh, use to control the people rather than trying to operate through the already established Catholic hierarchy. And so what they say is the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution have given us all of this ability to explore our own thoughts and use our own minds and the concept of Descartes, I think, therefore I am, using reason to solve life's problems. And so this is why they get rid of the Catholic Church uh, and replace it with the cult of reason. We can think our way out of these problems. Now remember the declaration of Pilnitz back in August of 1791. It takes a little more than six months, but France had been convinced that Austria was going to declare war. And sometimes the best defense is a good offense. And so on April 20th, 1792, France declares war on Austria. Now remember, Austria had said they were only going to go to war with France if all of the European nations got in it with them. But that would be if they were attacking. When they're attacked, of course they're going to fight back. Austria is allied with Prussia, and France begins losing 
almost immediately. This war turns out to be a terrible idea. Um, once, because Austria is allied with Prussia, Prussia ends up declaring war on France right away. The Prussian commander, the Duke of Brunswick, pushes his army uh, deep into France and says he's going to take any action necessary if it means preventing harm to the royal family. And he con includes the possible destruction of the city of Paris in his threat. He says he will stop at nothing to prevent harm to the royal family. He has reached central France in the vicinity of Paris by August. And so what is known as 10 August results. Um, a group of really irritated and frightened Parisians begins marching to the Tuileries demanding that the king abdicate his throne. Abdicate means voluntarily give it up, walk away. Louis and his family, hearing that this group, which they view as a mob, is approaching the palace, they run to the building where the Legislative Assembly is meeting and they say, please give us asylum, protect us from this mob. The Legislative Assembly responds by suspending Louis from office. And they say, we need a new constitutional convention. Clearly, the king can't be a part of this government. We need to write a new constitution. We're going to stop here today and we're going to cover the radical, radical portion of the French Revolution tomorrow, beginning with the September massacres.